This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Barnes. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Three, Part One. I intend in this chapter to give a description of the state in which England was at the time when the crown passed from Charles the Second to his brother. Such a description, composed from scanty and dispersed materials, must necessarily be very imperfect, yet it may perhaps correct some false notions which would make the subsequent narrative unintelligible or uninstructive. If we would study with profit the history of our ancestors, we must be constantly on our guard against that delusion which the well-known names of families, places, and offices naturally produce, and must never forget that the country of which we read was a very different country from that in which we live. In every experimental science there is a tendency towards perfection. In every human being there is a wish to ameliorate his own condition. These two principles have often sufficed, even when counteracted by great public calamities and by bad institutions, to carry civilization rapidly forward. No ordinary misfortune, no ordinary misgovernment, will do so much to make a nation wretched as the constant progress of physical knowledge and the constant effort of every man to better himself will do to make a nation prosperous. It has often been found that profuse expenditure, heavy taxation, absurd commercial restrictions, corrupt tribunals, disastrous wars, seditions, persecutions, conflagrations, inundations, have not been able to destroy capital so fast as the exertions of private citizens have been able to create it. It can easily be proved that in our own land the national wealth has, during at least six centuries, been almost uninterruptedly increasing that it was greater under the Tudors than under the Plantagenets, that it was greater under the Stuarts than under the Tudors, that, in spite of battles, sieges, and confiscations, it was greater on the day of the Restoration than on the day when the Long Parliament met, that, in spite of maladministration, of extravagance, of public bankruptcy, of too costly and unsuccessful wars, of the pestilence and of the fire, it was greater on the day of the death of Charles the Second than on the day of his restoration. This progress, having continued during many ages, became at length, about the middle of the eighteenth century, portentously rapid, and has proceeded, during the nineteenth, with accelerated velocity. In consequence, partly of our geographical and partly of our moral position, we have, during several generations, been exempt from evils which have elsewhere impeded the efforts and destroyed the fruits of industry. While every part of the continent, from Moscow to Lisbon, has been the theatre of bloody and devastating wars, no hostile standard has been seen here but as a trophy. While revolutions have taken place all around us, our government has never once been subverted by violence. During more than a hundred years there has been in our island no tumult of sufficient importance to be called an insurrection, nor has the law been once borne down, either by popular fury or by regal tyranny. Public credit has been held sacred, the administration of justice has been pure, even in times which might by Englishmen be justly called evil times, we have enjoyed what almost every other nation in the world would have considered as an ample measure of civil and religious freedom. Every man has felt entire confidence that the state would protect him in the possession of what had been earned by his diligence and hoarded by his self-denial. 
under the benignant influence of peace and liberty, science has flourished, and has been applied to practical purposes on a scale never before known. The consequence is that a change to which the history of the old world furnishes no parallel has taken place in our country. Could the England of 1685 be, by some magical process, set before our eyes, we should not know one landscape in a hundred, or one building in ten thousand. The country gentleman would not recognize his own fields. The inhabitant of the town would not recognize his own street. Everything has been changed, but the great features of nature, and a few massive and durable works of human art. We might find out Snowdon and Windermere, the Cheddar Cliffs and Beachy Head, we might find out here and there a Norman minster, or a castle which witnessed the Wars of the Roses. But with such rare exceptions, everything would be strange to us. Many thousands of square miles which are now rich cornland and meadow, intersected by green hedgerows and dotted with villages and pleasant country seats, would appear as moors overgrown with firs, or fens abandoned to wild ducks. We should see straggling huts built of wood and covered with thatch, where we now see manufacturing towns and seaports renowned to the farthest ends of the world. The capital itself would shrink to dimensions not much exceeding those of its present suburb on the south of the Thames. Not less strange to us would be the garb and manners of the people, the furniture and the equipages, the interior of the shops and dwellings. Such a change in the state of a nation seems to be at least as well entitled to the notice of a historian as any change of the dynasty or of the ministry. One of the first objects of an inquirer who wishes to form a correct notion of the state of a community at a given time must be to ascertain of how many persons that community then consisted. Unfortunately, the population of England in 1685 cannot be ascertained with perfect accuracy, for no great state had then adopted the wise course of periodically numbering the people. All men were left to conjecture for themselves, and as they generally conjectured without examining facts, and under the influence of strong passions and prejudices, their guesses were often ludicrously absurd. Even intelligent Londoners ordinarily talked of London as containing several millions of souls. It was confidently asserted by many that during the thirty-five years which had elapsed between the accession of Charles I and the Restoration, the population of the city had increased by two million. Even while the ravages of the plague and fire were recent, it was the fashion to say that the capital still had a million and a half of inhabitants. Some persons, disgusted by these exaggerations, ran violently into the opposite extreme. Thus Isaac Vossius, a man of undoubted parts and learning, strenuously maintained that there were only two millions of human beings in England, Scotland, and Ireland taken together. We are not, however, left without the means of correcting the wild blunders into which some minds were hurried by national vanity, and others by a morbid love of paradox. There are extant three computations which seem to be entitled to particular attention. They are entirely independent of each other, they proceed on different principles, and yet there is little difference in the results. One of these computations was made in the year 1696 by Gregory King, Lancaster Herald, a political arithmetician of great acuteness and judgment. The basis of his calculations was the number of houses returned in 1690 by the officers who made the last collection of the hearth money. The conclusion at which he arrived was that the population of England was nearly five millions and a half. About the same time, King William III was desirous to ascertain the comparative strength of the religious sects into which the community was divided. An inquiry was instituted, and reports were laid before him from all the dioceses of the realm. 
according to these reports, the number of his English subjects must have been about 5,200,000. Lastly, in our own days, Mr. Finlayson, an actuary of eminent skill, subjected the ancient parochial registers of baptisms, marriages, and burials to all the tests which the modern improvements in statistical science enabled him to apply. His conclusion was that, at the close of the seventeenth century, the population of England was a little under five million two hundred thousand souls. Of these three estimates, framed without concert by different persons from different sets of materials, the highest, which is that of King, does not exceed the lowest, which is that of Finlayson, by one-twelfth. We may, therefore, with confidence pronounce that, when James the Second reigned, England contained between five million and five million five hundred thousand inhabitants. On the highest supposition, she then had less than one-third of her present population, and less than three times the population which is now collected in her gigantic capital. End of part one. LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two. The increase of the people has been very great in every part of the kingdom, but generally much greater in the northern than in the southern shires. In truth, a large part of the country beyond Trent was, down to the eighteenth century, in a state of barbarism. Physical and moral causes had concurred to prevent civilization from spreading to that region. The air was inclement. The soil was generally such as required skilful and industrious cultivation, and there could be little skill or industry in a tract which was often the theatre of war, and which, even when there was nominal peace, was constantly desolated by bands of Scottish marauders, before the union of the two British crowns, and long after that union. There was as great a difference between Middlesex and Northumberland as there now is between Massachusetts and the settlements of those squatters, who, far to the west of the Mississippi, administer a rude justice with the rifle and the dagger. In the reign of Charles the Second, the traces left by ages of slaughter and pillage were distinctly perceptible, many miles south of the Tweed, in the face of the country, and in the lawless manners of the people. There was still a large class of moss troopers, whose calling was to plunder dwellings, and to drive away whole herds of cattle. It was found necessary, soon after the restoration, to enact laws of great severity, for the prevention of these outrages. The magistrates of Northumberland and Cumberland were authorised to raise bands of armed men for the defence of property, and order and provision was made for meeting the expense of these levies, by local taxation. The parishes were required to keep bloodhounds, for the purpose of hunting the freebooters. Many old men, who were living in the middle of the eighteenth century, could well remember the time when those ferocious dogs were common. Yet even with such auxiliaries, it was often found impossible to track the robbers to their retreats among the hills and morasses. For the geography of that wild country was very imperfectly known. Even after the accession of George the Third, the path over the fells from Borrowdale to Ravenglass was still a secret, carefully kept by the Dalesmen, some of whom had probably in their youth escaped from the pursuit of justice by that road. The seats of the gentry and the larger farmhouses were fortified. Oxen were penned at night beneath the overhanging battlements of the residence, which was known by the name of the Peel. The inmates slept with arms at their sides. Huge stones and boiling water were in readiness to crush and scold the plunderer, who might venture to assail the little garrison. No traveller ventured into that country without making his will. The judges on circuit with the whole body of barristers, attorneys, clerks, and serving men 
rode on horseback from Newcastle to Carlisle, armed and escorted by a strong guard under the command of the sheriffs. It was necessary to carry provisions, for the country was a wilderness which afforded no supplies. The spot where the cavalcade halted to dine, under an immense oak, is not yet forgotten. The irregular vigour with which criminal justice was administered shocked observers whose lives had been passed in more tranquil districts. Juries, animated by hatred and by a sense of common danger, convicted housebreakers and cattle-stealers with the promptitude of a court-martial in a mutiny, and the convicts were hurried by scores to the gallows. Within the memory of some whom this generation has seen, the sportsmen who wandered in pursuit of game to the sources of the Tyne, found the heaths round Kildar Castle, peopled by a race scarcely less savage than the Indians of California, and heard with surprise the half-naked women chanting a wild measure, while the men with brandished dirks danced a war-dance. Slowly, and with difficulty, peace was established on the border. In the train of peace came industry, and all the arts of life. Meanwhile, it was discovered that the regions north of the Trent possessed in their coal-beds a source of wealth far more precious than the gold-mines of Peru. It was found that in the neighbourhood of these beds almost every manufacturer might be most profitably carried on. A constant stream of emigrants began to roll northward. It appeared by the returns of 1841 that the ancient archiepiscopal province of York contained two-sevenths of the population of England. At the time of the Revolution that province was believed to contain only one-seventh of the population. In Lancashire the number of inhabitants appeared to have increased ninefold, while in Norfolk, Suffolk and Northamptonshire it has hardly doubled. Of the taxation we can speak with more confidence and precision than of the population. The revenue of England, when Charles the Second died, was small when compared with the resources which she even then possessed, or with the sums which were raised by the governments of the neighbouring countries. It had, from the time of the Restoration, been almost constantly increasing, yet it was a little more than three-fourths of the revenue of the United Provinces, and was hardly one-fifth of the revenue of France. The most important head of receipt was the excise, which in the last year of the reign of Charles produced five hundred and eighty-five thousand pounds, clear of all deductions. The net proceeds of the customs amounted in the same year to five hundred and thirty thousand pounds. These burdens did not lie very heavy on the nation. The tax on chimneys, though less productive, called forth far louder murmurs. The discontent excited by direct imposts is, indeed, almost always out of proportion to the quantity of money which they bring into the exchequer, and the tax on chimneys was, even among direct imposts, peculiarly odious, for it could be levied only by means of domiciliary visits, and of such visits the English have always been impatient to a degree which the people of other countries can but faintly conceive. The poorer householders were frequently unable to pay their hearth-money to the day. When this happened their furniture was distrained without mercy, for the tax was farmed, and a farmer of taxes is, of all creditors, proverbially the most rapacious. The collectors were loudly accused of performing their unpopular duty with harshness and insolence. It was said that as soon as they appeared at the threshold of a cottage, the children began to wail, and the old women ran to hide their earthenware. Nay, the single bed of a poor family had sometimes been carried away and sold. The net annual receipt from this tax was two hundred thousand pounds. When to the three great sources of income which have been mentioned we add the royal domains, then far more extensive than at present, the first fruits and tenths which had not yet been surrendered to the church, the duchies of Cornwall and Lancaster, the forfeitures and the fines, we shall find that the whole annual revenue of the crown may be fairly estimated at about £1,400,000. Of this revenue, 
Part was hereditary. The rest had been granted to Charles for life, and he was at liberty to lay out the whole exactly as he thought fit. Whatever he could save by retrenching from the expenditure of the public departments was an addition to his privy purse. Of the post office, more will hereafter be said. The profits of that establishment had been appropriated by Parliament to the Duke of York. The King's revenue was, or rather ought to have been, charged with the payment of about eighty thousand pounds a year. The interest of the sum fraudulently destined in the exchequer by the cabal. While Danby was at the head of the finances, the creditors had received dividends, though not with the strict punctuality of modern times. But those who had succeeded him at the treasury had been less expert, or less solicitous to maintain public faith. Since the victory won by the court over the Whigs, not a farthing had been paid, and no redress was granted to the sufferers, till a new dynasty had been many years on the throne. There can be no greater error than to imagine that the device of meeting the exigences of the state by loans was imported into our island by William the Third. What really dates from his reign is not the system of borrowing, but the system of funding. From a period of immemorable antiquity, it had been the practice of every English government to contract debts. What the revolution introduced was the practice of honestly paying them. By plundering the public creditor, it was possible to make an income of about £1,400,000, with some occasional help from Versailles support the necessary charges of the government, and the wasteful expenditure of the court. For that load which pressed most heavily on the finances of the great continental states was here scarcely felt. In France, Germany, and the Netherlands, armies such as Henry the Fourth and Philip the Second had never employed in time of war were kept in the midst of peace. Bastions and ravelling were everywhere rising, constructed on principles unknown to Parma and Spinola. Stores of artillery and ammunition were accumulated, such as even Richelieu, whom the preceding generation had regarded as a worker of prodigies, would have pronounced fabulous. No man could journey many leagues in those countries without hearing the drums of a regiment on march, or being challenged by the sentinels on the drawbridge of a fortress. In our island, on the contrary, it was possible to live long and to travel far without being once reminded, by any martial sight or sound, that the defence of the nations had become a science and a calling. The majority of Englishmen who were under twenty-five years of age had probably never seen a company of regular soldiers. Of the cities, which in the Civil War had valiantly repelled hostile armies, scarcely one was now capable of sustaining a siege. The gates stood open night and day, the ditches were dry, the ramparts had been suffered to fall into decay, or were repaired only that the townsfolk might have a pleasant walk on summer evenings. Of the old baronial keeps, many had been shattered by the cannon of Fairfax and Cromwell, and lay in heaps of ruin, overgrown with ivy. Those which remained had lost their martial character, and were now rural palaces of the aristocracy. The moats were turned to preserves of carp and pike. The mounds were planted with fragrant shrubs, through which spiral walks ran up to summer houses, adorned with mirrors and paintings. On the capes of the sea-coast, and on many inland hills, were still seen tall posts, surmounted by barrels. Once these barrels had been filled with pitch, watchmen had been set around them in seasons of danger, and, within a few hours after a Spanish sail had been discovered in the channel, or after a thousand Scottish moss-troopers had crossed the Tweed, the signal fires were blazing fifty miles off, and whole counties were rising in arms. But many years had now elapsed since the beacons had been lighted, and they were regarded rather as curious relics of ancient manners than as parts of a machinery necessary to the safety of the state. End of Part 2
The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Three. The only army which the law recognized was the militia. That force had been remodeled by two acts of Parliament, passed shortly after the Restoration. Every man who possessed five hundred pounds a year derived from land, or six thousand pounds of personal estate, was bound to provide, equip, and pay, at his own charge, one horseman. Every man who had fifty pounds a year derived from land, or six hundred pounds of personal estate, was charged in like manner with one pikeman or musketeer. Smaller proprietors were joined together in a kind of society, for which our language does not afford a special name, but which an Athenian would have called a syntelia, and each society was required to furnish, according to its own means, a horse soldier or a foot soldier. The whole number of cavalry and infantry thus maintained was popularly estimated at a hundred thirty thousand men. The king was, by the ancient constitution of the realm, and by the recent and solemn acknowledgment of both houses of parliament, the sole captain general of this large force. The lords lieutenant and their deputies held the command under him, and appointed meetings for drilling and inspection. The time occupied by such meetings, however, was not to exceed fourteen days in one year. The justices of the peace were authorized to inflict severe penalties for breaches of discipline. Of the ordinary cost, no part was paid by the crown. But when the train bands were called out against an enemy, their subsistence became a charge on the general revenue of the state, and they were subject to the utmost rigor of martial law. There were those who looked on the militia with no friendly eye. Men who had travelled much on the continent, who had marvelled at the stern precision with which every sentinel moved and spoke in the citadels built by Vauban, who had seen the mighty armies which poured along all the roads of Germany to chase the Ottoman from the gates of Vienna, and who had been dazzled by the well-ordered pomp of the household troops of Lewis, sneered much at the way in which the peasants of Devonshire and Yorkshire marched and wheeled, shouldered muskets and ported pikes. The enemies of the liberties and religion of England looked with aversion on a force which could not, without extreme risk, be employed against those liberties and that religion, and missed no opportunity of throwing ridicule on the rustic soldiery. Enlightened patriots, when they contrasted these rude levies with the battalions which, in times of war, a few hours might bring to the coast of Kent or Sussex, were forced to acknowledge that, Dangerous as it might be to keep up a permanent military establishment, it might be more dangerous still to stake the honor and independence of the country on the result of a contest between plowmen officered by justices of the peace and veteran warriors led by marshals of France. In Parliament, however, it was necessary to express such opinions with some reserve, for the militia was an institution eminently popular. Every reflection thrown on it excited the indignation of both the great parties in the state, and especially of that party which was distinguished by peculiar zeal for monarchy and for the Anglican Church. The array of the counties was commanded almost exclusively by Tory noblemen and gentlemen. They were proud of their military rank, and considered an insult offered to the service to which they belonged as offered to themselves. They were also perfectly aware that whatever was said against a militia was said in favor of a standing army, and the name of the standing army was hateful to them. One such army had held dominion in England, and under that dominion the king had been murdered, the nobility degraded, the landed gentry plundered, the church persecuted. There was scarcely a rural grandee who could not tell a story of wrongs and insults suffered by himself or by his father at the hands of the parliamentary soldiers. One old cavalier had seen his manor-house blown up. The hereditary elms of another had been hewn down. A third could never go into his parish church without being reminded by the defaced scutcheons and headless statues of his ancestry that Oliver's redcoats had once stabled their horses there. The consequence was that those very royalists, who were most ready to fight for the king themselves, were the last persons whom he could venture to ask for the means of hiring regular troops. Charles, however, had a few months after his restoration begun to form a small standing army. He felt that, without some better protection than that of the train bands and beef eaters, his palace and person would hardly be secure, in the vicinity of a great city swarming with warlike fifth monarchy men who had just been disbanded. He therefore, careless and profuse as he was, 
contrived to spare from his pleasures a sum sufficient to keep up a body of guards. With the increase of trade and of public wealth his revenues increased, and he was thus enabled, in spite of the occasional murmurs of the commons, to make gradual additions to his regular forces. One considerable addition was made a few months before the close of his reign. The costly, useless, and pestilential settlement of Tangier was abandoned to the barbarians who dwelt around it, and the garrison, consisting of one regiment of horse and two regiments of foot, was brought to England. The little army formed by Charles the Second was the germ of that great and renowned army which has, in the present century, marched triumphant into Madrid and Paris, into Canton and Kandahar. The lifeguards, who now form two regiments, were then distributed into three troops, each of which consisted of two hundred carabiners, exclusive of officers. This corps, to which the safety of the king and royal family was confided, had a very peculiar character. Even the privates were designated as gentlemen of the guard. Many of them were of good families, and had held commissions in the Civil War. Their pay was far higher than that of the most favored regiment of our time, and would in that age have been thought a respectable provision for the younger son of a country squire. Their fine horses, their rich housings, their cuirasses, and their buff coats adorned with ribbons, velvet, and gold lace, made a splendid appearance in St. James's Park. A small body of grenadier dragoons, who came from a lower class and received lower pay, was attached to each troop. Another body of household cavalry, distinguished by blue coats and cloaks, and still called the blues, was generally quartered in the neighborhood of the capital. Near the capital lay also the corps which is now designated as the first regiment of dragoons, but which was then the only regiment of dragoons on the English establishment. It had recently been formed out of the cavalry which had returned from Tangier. A single troop of dragoons, which did not form part of any regiment, was stationed near Berwick, for the purpose of keeping the peace among the moss troopers of the border. For this species of service the dragoon was then thought to be peculiarly qualified. He has since become a mere horse-soldier. But in the seventeenth century he was accurately described by Montecuculli as a foot-soldier who used a horse only in order to arrive with more speed at the place where military service was to be performed. The household infantry consisted of two regiments, which were then, as now, called the first regiment of foot-guards and the cold-stream guards. They generally did duty near Whitehall and St. James's Palace. As there were then no barracks, and as, by the petition of right, it had been declared unlawful to quarter soldiers on private families, the redcoats filled all the alehouses of Westminster and the Strand. There were five other regiments of foot. One of these, called the Admiral's Regiment, was especially destined to service on board of the fleet. The remaining four still rank as the first four regiments of the line. Two of these represented two brigades which had long sustained on the continent the fame of British valor. The first, or royal regiment, had, under the great Gustavus, borne a conspicuous part in the deliverance of Germany. The third regiment, distinguished by flesh-colored facings, from which it had derived the well-known name of the Buffs, had, under Maurice of Nassau, fought not less bravely for the deliverance of the Netherlands. Both these gallant bands had at length, after many vicissitudes, been recalled from foreign service by Charles the Second, and had been placed on the English establishment. The regiments which now rank as the second and fourth of the line had, in 1685, just returned from Tangier, bringing with them cruel and licentious habits contracted in a long course of warfare with the Moors. A few companies of infantry which had not been regimented lay in garrison at Tilbury Fort, at Portsmouth, at Plymouth, and at some other important stations on or near the coast. End of Part 3 Is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Four. Since the beginning of the seventeenth century, great change had taken place in the arms of the infantry. The pike had been gradually given place to the musket. 
and at the close of the reign of Charles the Second, most of his foot were musketeers. Still, however, there was a large intermixture of pikemen. Each class of troops was occasionally instructed in the use of the weapon, which peculiarly belonged to the other class. Every foot soldier had at his side a sword for close fight. The musketeer was generally provided with a weapon which had, during many years, been gradually coming into use, and which the English then called a dagger, but which, from the time of William the Third, had been known among us by the French name of bayonet. The bayonet seemed not to have been then so formidable an instrument of destruction as it has since become, for it was inserted in the muzzle of the gun, and in action much time was lost while the soldier unfixed his bayonet in order to fire, and fixed it again in order to charge. The dragoon, when dismounted, fought as a musketeer. The regular army, which was kept up in England at the beginning of the year 1685, consisted, all ranks included, of about 7,000 foot, and about 1,700 cavalry and dragoons. The whole charge amounted to about 290,000 pounds a year less than a tenth part of what the military establishment of France then cost in time of peace. The daily pay of a private in the life guards was four shillings, in the blues two shillings and sixpence, in the dragoons eighteen pence, in the foot guards ten pence, and in the line eight pence. The discipline was lax, and indeed could not be otherwise. The common law of England knew nothing of courts martial and made no distinction in times of peace between a soldier and any other subject. Nor could the government then venture to ask even the most loyal Parliament for a mutiny bill. A soldier, therefore, by knocking down his colonel, incurred only the ordinary penalties of assault and battery, and by refusing to obey orders, by sleeping on guard, or by deserting his colours, incurred no legal penalty at all. Military punishments were doubtless inflicted during the reign of Charles the Second, but they were inflicted very sparingly, and in such a manner as not to attract public notice, or to produce an appeal to the courts of Westminster Hall. Such an army, as has been described, was not very likely to enslave five millions of Englishmen. It would indeed have been unable to suppress an insurrection in London if the train bands of the city had joined the insurgents. Nor could the king expect that if a rising took place in England, he would obtain effectual help from his other dominions. For, though both Scotland and Ireland supported separate military establishments, those establishments were not more than sufficient to keep down the Puritan malcontents of the former kingdom, and the Popish malcontents of the latter. The government had, however, an important military resource, which must not be left unnoticed. There were in the pay of the United Provinces six fine regiments, of which three had been raised in England, and three in Scotland. The native prince had reserved to himself the power of recalling them, if he needed their help against a foreign or domestic enemy. In the meantime, they were maintained without any charge to him, and were kept under an excellent discipline, to which he could not have ventured to subject them. If the jealousy of the Parliament and of the nation made it impossible for the King to maintain a formidable standing army, no similar impediment prevented him from making England the first of maritime powers. Both Whigs and Tories were ready to applaud every step, tending to increase the efficiency of that force, which, while it was the best protection of the island against foreign enemies, was powerless against civil liberty. All the greatest exploits achieved within the memory of that generation by English soldiers had been achieved in war against English princes. The victories of our sailors had been won over foreign foes, and had averted havoc and rapine from our own soil. By at least half the nation, the Battle of Naseby was remembered with horror, and the Battle of Dunbar with pride, chequered by many painful feelings. But the defeat of the Armada, and the encounters of Blake with the Hollanders and Spaniards, were recollected with unmixed exultation by all parties. Ever since the Restoration, the Commons 
even when most discontented and most parsimonious, had always been bountiful to profusion, where the interest of the navy was concerned. It had been represented to them, while Danby was minister, that many of the vessels in the royal fleet were old and unfit for sea, and although the house was at that time in no giving mood, an aid of near six hundred thousand pounds had been granted for the building of thirty new men of war. But the liberality of the nation had been made fruitless by the vices of the government. The list of the king's ships, it is true, looked well. There were nine first rates, fourteen second rates, thirty-nine third rates, and many smaller vessels. The first rates, indeed, were less than the third rates of our time, and the third rates would not now rank as very large frigates. This force, however, if it had been efficient, would in those days have been regarded by the greatest potentate as formidable. But it existed only on paper. When the reign of Charles terminated, his navy had sunk into degradation and decay, such as would be almost incredible if it were not certified to us by the independent and concurring evidence of witnesses whose authority is beyond exception. Pepys, the ablest man in the English admiralty, drew up in the year 1684, memorial on the state of his department, for the information of Charles. A few months later, Bonrepo, the ablest man in the French admiralty, having visited England for the especial purpose of ascertaining her maritime strength, laid the result of his inquiries before Louis. The two reports are to the same effect. Bonrepo declared that he found everything in disorder and in miserable condition that the superiority of the French marine was acknowledged with shame and envy at Whitehall, and that the state of our shipping and dockyards was of itself a sufficient guarantee that we should not meddle in the disputes of Europe. Pepys informed his master that the naval administration was a prodigy of wastefulness, corruption, ignorance and indolence that no estimate could be trusted, that no contract was performed, that no check was enforced. The vessels which the recent liberality of Parliament had enabled the government to build, and which had never been out of harbour, had been of such wretched timber that they were more unfit to go to sea than the old hulls which had been battered thirty years before by Dutch and Spanish broadsides. Some of the new men of war, indeed, were so rotten that unless speedily repaired, they would go down at their moorings. The sailors were paid with so little punctuality that they were glad to find some usurer who would purchase their tickets at forty per cent discounts. The commanders, who had not powerful friends at court, were even worse treated. Some officers, to whom large arrears were due, after vainly importuning the government during many years, had died for want of a morsel of bread. Most of the ships which were afloat were commanded by men who had not been bred to the sea. This, it is true, was not an abuse introduced by the government of Charles. No state, ancient or modern, had before that time made a complete separation between the naval and military service. In the great civilized nations of antiquity, Simon and Lysander, Pompey and Agrippa, had fought battles by sea as well as by land. Nor had the impulse which nautical science received at the close of the fifteenth century produced any division of labour. At Flodden, the right wing of the victorious army was led by the Admiral of England. At Jarnac and Montcontour, the Huguenot ranks were marshalled by the Admiral of France. Neither John of Austria, the conqueror of Lepanto, nor Lord Howard of Effingham, to whose direction the marine of England was confided when the Spanish invaders were approaching our shores, had received the education of a sailor. Raleigh, highly celebrated as a naval commander, had served during many years as a soldier in France, the Netherlands and Ireland. Blake had distinguished himself by his skilful and valiant defence of an inland town before he humbled the pride of Holland and of Castile on the ocean. Since the Restoration the same system had been followed— Great fleets had been entrusted to the direction of Rupert and Monk. Rupert, who was renowned chiefly as a hot and daring cavalry officer, and Monk, who, when he wished his ship to change her course, moved the mirth of his crew by calling out, "'Wheel to the left!' 
But about this time, wise men began to perceive that the rapid improvement, both of the art of war and of the art of navigation, made it necessary to draw the line between two professions, which had hitherto been confounded. Either the command of a regiment or the command of a ship was now a matter quite sufficient to occupy the attention of a single mind. In the year 1672, the French government determined to educate young men of good family from a very early age, especially for the sea service. But the English government, instead of following this excellent example, not only continued to distribute high naval commands among landsmen, but selected for such commands landsmen who, even on land, could not safely have been put in any important trust. Any lad of noble birth, any dissolute courtier, for whom one of the king's mistresses would speak a word, might hope that a ship of the line, and with it the honour of the country and the lives of hundreds of brave men, would be committed to his care. It mattered not that he had never in his life taken a voyage, except on the Thames, that he could not keep his feet in a breeze, that he did not know the difference between latitude and longitude. No previous training was thought necessary, or at most he was sent to make a short trip in a man-of-war, where he was subjected to no discipline, where he was treated with marked respect, and where he lived in a round of revels and amusement. If, in the intervals of feasting, drinking, and gambling, he succeeded in learning the meaning of a few technical phrases and the names of the points of the compass, he was thought fully qualified to take charge of a three-decker. This is no imaginary description. In 1666, John Sheffield, Earl of Mulgrave, at seventeen years of age, volunteered to serve at sea against the Dutch. He passed six weeks on board, diverting himself as well as he could, in the society of some young libertines of rank, and then returned home to take the command of a troop of horse. After this, he was never on the water till the year 1672, when he again joined the fleet, and was almost immediately appointed captain of a ship of eighty-four guns, reputed the finest in the navy. He was then twenty-three years old, and had not, in the whole course of his life, been three months afloat. As soon as he came back from sea, he was made colonel of a regiment of foot. This is a specimen of the manner in which naval commands of the highest importance were then given, and a very favourable specimen, for Mulgrave, though he wanted experience, wanted neither part nor courage. Others were promoted in the same way, who not only were not good officers, but who were intellectually and morally incapable of ever becoming good officers, and whose only recommendation was that they had been ruined by folly and vice. The chief bait which allured these men into the service was the profit of conveying bullion and other valuable commodities from port to port. For both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean were then so much infested by pirates from Barbary, that merchants were not willing to trust precious cargoes to any custody but that of a man of war. A captain might thus clear several thousands of pounds by a short voyage, and for this lucrative business he too often neglected the interests of his country and the honour of his flag, made mean submissions to foreign powers, disobeyed the most direct injunctions of his superiors, lay in port when he was ordered to chase a Sally Rover, or ran with dollars to Leghorn, when his instructions directed him to repair to Lisbon. And all this he did with impunity. The same interest which had placed him in a post, for which was unfit, maintained him there. No admiral, bearded by these corrupt and dissolute minions of the palace, dared to do more than mutter something about a court-martial. If any officer showed a higher sense of duty than his fellows, he soon found out that he lost money without acquiring honour. One captain, who by strictly obeying the orders of the admiralty, Mr. Cargo, which would have been worth four thousand pounds to him, was told by Charles with ignoble levity that he was a great fool for his pains. The discipline of the navy was of a piece throughout. As the courtly captain despised the admiralty, he was in turn despised by his crew. 
It could not be concealed that he was inferior in seamanship to every foremast man on board. It was idle to expect that old sailors, familiar with the hurricanes of the tropics and with the icebergs of the Arctic Circle, would pay prompt and respectful obedience to a chief who knew no more of winds and waves than could be learned in a gilded barge between Whitehall Stairs and Hampton Court. To trust such a novice with the working of a ship was evidently impossible. The direction of navigation was therefore taken from the captain and given to the master, but this partition of authority produced innumerable inconveniences. The line of demarcation was not, and perhaps could not be, drawn with precision. There was therefore constant wrangling. The captain, confident in proportion to his ignorance, treated the master with lordly contempt. The master, well aware of the danger of disobliging the powerful, too often, after a struggle, yielded against his better judgment, and it was well if the loss of the ship and crew was not the consequence. In general, the least mischievous of the aristocratical captains were those who completely abandoned to others the direction of the vessels, and thought only of making money and spending it. The way in which these men lived was so ostentatious and voluptuous that, greedy as they were of gain, they seldom became rich. They dressed as if for a gala at Versailles, ate off plate, drank the richest wines, and kept harems on board, while hunger and scurvy raged among the crews, and while corpses were daily flung out of the portholes. Such was the ordinary character of those who were then called gentlemen captains. Mingled with them were to be found, happily for our country, naval commanders of a very different description. Men whose whole life had been passed on the deep, and who had worked and fought their way from the lowest officers of the forecastle to rank and distinction. One of the most eminent of these officers was Sir Christopher Mings, who entered the service as a cabin boy, who fell fighting bravely against the Dutch, and whom his crew, weeping and vowing vengeance, carried to the grave. From him sprang, by a singular kind of descent, a line of valiant and expert sailors. His cabin boy was Sir John Narborough, and the cabin boy of Sir John Narborough was Sir Cloudsley Shovel. To the strong natural sense and dauntless courage of this class of men, England owes a debt never to be forgotten. It was by such resolute hearts that, in spite of much maladministration, and in spite of the blunders and treasons of more courtly admirals, our coasts were protected, and the reputation of our flag upheld, during many gloomy and perilous years. But to a landsman, these tarpaulins, as they were called, seemed a strange and half-savage race. All their knowledge was professional, and their professional knowledge was practical, rather than scientific. Of their own element, they were as simple as children. Their deportment was uncouth. There was roughness in their very good nature. And their talk, where it was not made up of nautical phrases, was too commonly made up of oaths and curses. Such were the chiefs in whose rude school were formed these sturdy warriors, from whose Smollett in the next age drew Lieutenant Bowling and Commodore Trunnion. But it does not matter that there was in the service of any of the Stuarts a single naval officer, such as, according to the notions of our times, a naval officer ought to be. That is to say, a man versed in the theory and practice of his calling, and steeled against all the dangers of battle and tempest, yet of cultivated mind and polished manners. There were gentlemen, and there were seamen, in the navy of Charles the Second, but the seamen were not gentlemen, and the gentlemen were not seamen. The English navy at that time might, according to the most exact estimates which have come down to us, have been kept in an efficient state for three hundred and eighty thousand pounds a year. Four hundred thousand pounds a year was the sum actually expended, but expended, as we have seen, to very little purpose. The cost of the French marine was nearly the same, the cost of the Dutch marine considerably more. The charge of the English ordnance in the seventeenth century was, as compared with other military and naval charges, much smaller than at present. At most of the garrisons there were gunners, and here and there 
at an important post, an engineer was to be found. But there was no regiment of artillery, no brigade of sappers and miners, no college in which young soldiers could learn the scientific part of the art of war. The difficulty of moving field pieces was extreme. When, a few years later, William marched from Devonshire to London, the apparatus which he brought with him, though such as had long been in constant use on the continent, and such as would now be regarded at Woolwich as rude and cumbrous, excited in our ancestors an admiration resembling that which the Indians of America felt for the Castilian harquebuses. The stock of gunpowder, kept in the English forts and arsenals, was boastfully mentioned by patriotic writers, as something which might well impress neighbouring nations with awe. It amounted to fourteen or fifteen thousand barrels, about a twelfth of the quantity which it is now thought necessary to have in store. The expenditure, under the head of ordnance, was, on an average, a little above sixty thousand pounds a year. The whole effective charge of the army, navy, and ordnance was about seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds. The non-effective charge, which is now a heavy part of our public burdens, can hardly be said to have existed. A very small number of naval officers, who were not employed in the public service, drew half pay. No lieutenant was on the list, nor any captain who had not commanded a ship of the first or second rate. As the country then possessed only seventeen ships of the first and second rate that had ever been at sea, and as large a proportion of the persons who had commanded such ships had good posts on shore, the expenditure under this head must have been small indeed. In the army, half-pay was given merely as a special and temporary allowance to a small number of officers belonging to two regiments, which were peculiarly situated. Greenwich Hospital had not been founded. Chelsea Hospital was building, but the cost of that institution was defrayed partly by a deduction from the pay of the troops, and partly by private subscription. The King promised to contribute only £20,000 for architectural expenses, and 5000 a year for the maintenance of the invalids. It was no part of the plan that there should be out-pensioners. The whole non-effective charge, military and naval, can scarcely have exceeded £10,000 a year. It now exceeds £10,000 a day. Of the expense of civil government, only a small portion was depraved by the Crown. The great majority of the functionaries, whose business was to administer justice, preserve order, either gave their services to the public gratuitously, or were remunerated in a manner which caused no drain on the revenue of the State. The sheriffs, mayors, and aldermen of the towns, the country gentlemen, who were in the commission of the peace, the headboroughs, bailiffs, and petty constables, cost the king nothing. The superior courts of law were chiefly supported by fees. End of part four.